Hi, my name is Benedict for High Hertz. This is one of the training series, and in this we're looking at a thing that I'm commonly talking about, but I'm looking at a specific example here. It's about subtle movement. Specifically here we're going to look at EQ, but as always I will explain the deeper thing to it, and also point out a uh, little dilemma that I see happening when people totally miss the point of this, and then wonder why their recordings or mixings don't come out the way that they hope for. They lack bigness. They think that they're chasing more volume when, matter of fact, they're missing excitement. They're missing dynamics. They're missing interest. This is all about creating those little things that go way further than you would think that they should based on the smallness of what's happening. But these little things are what makes people so excited about analog gear because it's constantly doing kind of random messed up things. To give you a concept of what we're looking at, you see we've got a very si simple sequence. It's gonna sound something like this. We'll take it back to the beginning. And what I'd hope you'd notice from that is nothing to do with genre or whether you like the style or anything like that, is that it's nice, but it's kind of rigid and also sort of quite flat and unmoving. Now with really two, maybe three moves in here, I hope that you'll notice there's a fair difference. It's original. What I'd hope you know straight away is like, wow, that's just more engaging. It feels bigger. I've done everything I can to match the levels exactly as to how close they are. I don't know, but they're not noticeably dramatically different. So it's not really about level. There's some other things and they are subtle movements. One of them is reverb. So we'll take reverb out for the moment. Back to the original. pop that reverb back in. Now, I don't know how many of you will be able to f hear or feel, more important, feel the difference, and then how many of you can actually pick at least one of the things that's being done here. Now, don't entirely feel bad if you can't because mixing's not about technical things. People are sometimes surprised that I don't notice things, and it's like I'm not interested in the technical. I really am not. What I'm interested in is how something makes me feel, because music's all about storytelling. Uh, if I can feel what the storyteller is trying to have me feel, then it's a win. If I can't, then, well, it's not a win. Uh, being able to say, he used this exact technique and put the knob there, that's not a win at all, because chances are the person who saying all that stuff can't actually explain the story or the feeling that they're being given. Remember, art's about feeling. If you want it to feel big in people's imaginations, because it's where the music all happens, none of this is music, this is just random noises. And I'm not talking about my composition, I'm talking about all recorded music being illusion. Uh, if you can't get that illusion, then you know, you need to work with somebody who can develop that illusion or learn to develop it in yourself. This gives you some ideas for doing that. So with subtle movements of primarily EQ, actually it's all EQ with the exception of this reverb, we have changed the feel of that piece quite dramatically. So again... Let's look at why this works. 
how to not fall into a trap. And then the second part will go through and actually look at how it works broadly and then dig down into what was done here to achieve these results. Now, bear in mind, this is not everything with a mix. I'm pulling out a particular aspect, a particular thing that you can work with when it serves a need. So the first thing is movement. What is the concept of movement and why is it so important? Why do I go on about it so much? Well, things have to move. If they don't move, they're dead. A plant, if a plant's not growing, what's it doing? Dead. If an animal is not moving, what's it doing? Dead. If humans are not moving, what are we doing? Dead. If we're not thinking, if we're not feeling, well, we might be technically alive, but dead. Zombies. Uh, so we need to do this as artists. We need to move people. When you look at a picture by Van Gogh, the crazy painting guy with the star, then it elicits a response. When we look at the scream, then it elicits a response. Doesn't mean you have to like these things at all. I'm not sure whether I do as such. But they elicit a response. Therefore, they are good art. The reason that this is important and the reason that this works, and I've spoken about it lots of times, is because of what I refer to as the hunter brain. We are designed to be hunters. doesn't matter whether you're a male, female, or identify yourself as whatever. We're designed to be hunters. If you identify yourself as human, then you're designed to go out and spear defenseless little animals, often with great big tusks that they want to jam into our guts, so they're not that defenseless, believe me. Um, or if you're of the, um, of the Heidi variety and got a patch in your apron, then you're going around looking for herbs to put in your patch. We are all hunters. We're all designed to go out and find things and bring them back to have our lives mean something, or at least eat dinner, which is meaning in itself. It's continuation. The hunter brain works on recognizing patterns, but also finding differences in those patterns. So it's very easy to look at all plants and go, well, they're all plants, just as I refer to all birds as ducks. Well, they're all ducks. Um, it's a joke because I know that there's a difference between them. And sometimes people get very pedantic when I point to another bird and it's a seagull or whatever and say, oh, duck, that's not. It's like you're missing the point. <laughs> there is a joke in there that they're all ducks. The hunter brain I referred to in the common story I've used is of hunting rabbits, in that rabbits do their best to be invisible because they don't actually have big tusks to jam into our guards and they're relatively defenseless other than being able to run fast. So they will do what they can to hide. And if we're out hunting rabbits for our dinner to please our mates uh, so that they let us make babies with them, then that entails a fair amount of lying around in the bushes, waiting for movement. And the rabbits are like, standing really still, so that they hope that we don't see them and wander away and go hunt another rabbit rather than them. It's movement that allows us to actually go, there's a rabbit in there, and get all stabby stabby. Things must move. If they don't move, there's no interest. We will move on. The audience will move on. And one of the big problems we have with modern music post-80s is that it tends not to move at all. People put a lot of time into trying to do things to make it seem all movie, like... Oh, OK, now we've made that sound better because it moves. And on a technicality, yeah, you got me, it does. But they've forgotten that... ...is a better form of movement than just having it go burble, burble, burble. You could always do both. Although, to some extent, the burble, burble, burble actually diminishes the power of the melodic movement. It's up to the composer and engineer who's mixing it to work out where the right balance is. I was actually just um, looking, listening to some patches made uh, with the new grain engine for a uh, phase plant. Uh, and um, wow, absolutely amazing and really impressive. Down the track, they could become problematic in a mix because they were meddling with melody and chopping up melody. 
but they weren't creating melodic direction. So there was movement galore, but it maybe lacked purpose. So the hunter brain is constantly looking for movement to reconcile, is this a friend? Is this an enemy? Is this a wabbit that I can spear? Or is this a wabbit that is too far away for me to be able to spear, in which case I might be better lying where I am so the wabbit comes closer. We look for small changes. We need to have small changes in our music to keep it fresh. Making big dramatic changes, okay, but if they're just too dramatic and without purpose, they're not actually adding any value other than ear candy, which quickly becomes pointless. We've got to make sure that we don't do that. Now, one of the great things is that EQ is not what people think it's about. Yes, it has some of what people think it's about, in the sense that where we have an EQ, let's just pull these out of the way for the moment, where we have an EQ, it's easy to think, well, it's all just about increasing or decreasing these frequencies. And there's been an obsession lately with um, completely phased linear EQs. Okay, I guess they do serve a purpose in that they do exactly what we think that EQs are about, but they miss what makes EQs so exciting, which is that when we do this, and you can hear it here, There's a sense of this sounding a little bit like a phaser or a flanger. Because EQ is built on phase shifting as well. A classic analog EQ is actually shifting phases to give us the illusion of making these frequencies louder and softer. Exactly how it's done in digital, I don't know. A lot of times they are minimal phase shifts, and maybe that's a win, maybe not. But even with minimal phase shift, what we can do is use small movements. And there is a difference. But if we start to move that as well, hear that? Flat and predictable. It's like, oh, that's actually creating a kind of tension. Obviously, I'm in headphones, so it's very intimate and, and overwhelming. But even in speakers from a distance, We've added an emotional element to this because the, the hunter brain looking for wabbits is going, ooh, there's something, there's something moving here. So we can define how we want that movement to be. So there's one set of movement that's there, another set that's here. This is the one that I've discussed quite a few times, Dynamic EQ, uh, TD uh, Nova, and uh, Telnikov. It's been quite some time going over Dynamic EQ, this isn't really a dynamic EQ, it's just an LFO going up and down. But if we add the pair of these together, and let's see if we can bring that. We've got a huge amount of movement now. And that within the mix isn't something that people are going to say, oh, you're using this, not in, not in the dramatic kind of this way, but they will still be a little bit aware of this because it's drawing their attention to it. Now, how you do this is important. We've looked at the concept of movement. We also need to look at the concept of experimentation. Let me sidestep for a moment. This is highly relevant, uh, but it's, it's, it's an important thing to understand because those who misunderstand it struggle tremendously for years, decades, or never get it. I was in a particular door group, and somebody popped up saying, I do experimental EDM. Okay, assuming there's such a thing, but fair enough, I'll take your word for it. 
He said, I can't find videos within this particular door for how I should do experimental EDM. I'm thinking, well, hang on, dude, we've got a couple of problems here. Experiment means that we try new things and that we don't be held by, this is the way you do it. So, hey, why do you need to watch videos on how to experiment? Surely experimenting is just going out there and doing whatever leads you somewhere. I want to make this sound frightening, therefore I work out how do I make this jiggle in ways that create tension. That's experimenting. Uh, he was more looking for how do I make somebody else's sound? And somebody's defined this genre as being X, so how do I make sound X? That's, that's not the way things really work. There is certain thing to be achieved in that, in following and learning a technique. But the other problem was that he was in door X and was complaining that all the videos on how to be experimental were in door Y. Meaning that not only did he want to be told exactly where to put the knobs, but he wanted to be told exactly where to put the knobs that he had, rather than being able to extrapolate. So if we took a story of something like Pink Floyd, I think it was Dark Side of the Moon, that they dragged a loudspeaker and microphone out into the stairwell to get a reverb space. Now, maybe they did that because Mott the Hoople was using the chamber already. Maybe they were doing it because Mott the Hoople was using the chamber and David Bowie was using uh, the, the, the other studio, so there wasn't a spare room. Maybe they were doing it because one of the guys, Rick Wright or whoever, had been having a fag in the stairwell and clicked his fingers and gone, wow, what an amazing sound, man, and walked back in and said, hey, Alan, man, we should just, you know, like make the, the stairwell, man, and they dragged everything out there for, for a lark. I don't know. That story is not meant to be taken literally. It doesn't mean that we should drag loudspeakers out into our stairwell or outside or into the toilet or anywhere. It's just that concept of going, we can do things outside of the box. We don't have to only use what we've got here. We've got ways of experimenting. So the idea of it being experimental should be that we say, okay, what have I got? How, learn how to use what we've got and then learn how to step beyond the conventions of what we've got and the important thing there is story as i said here do i want to make this seem more aggravating tense I look to do the things that develop that feeling, not by saying this is the formula that I take or this is how Band X did it. This is a really important thing. If you're looking for a feel in your composing, your mixing, whatever, whether you're mixing your own stuff or somebody else's, if you're mixing somebody else's, you really shouldn't be watching these videos for training because it means you shouldn't be mixing other people's stuff, but nonetheless, it happens. Then be thinking about how do I understand the story I'm trying to tell, and then work out ways to tell that story, not by cloning somebody else. So please don't take what I'm going to show in the second half of this as being exactly what you do. They're merely ideas, things that I've done before, and will probably do again, when I feel like they serve a purpose. I will do different things in other situations where I feel like the purpose is different. So let's run through. Remember, we've got our piece here, really pretty flat and proper, now vastly richer, just with a couple of basic moves. Yes, there's a reverb, anything without reverb is, to me, just not done, because the reverb gives us a place. It also carries and emphasizes whatever we put into it. That's the whole idea of a reverb, to make more of, to beautify. I know there's some mindset of like, oh, it just makes everything creepy and uncool, man. But it's like, okay, go look at that. Make your own mixes, but make them great mixes. Don't just make it things that are fear of beauty. Let's look through. We've got our drums here. Just so you can focus on one thing. There are two things happening in here. 
we'll turn one of them off. I'll emphasize this. Hopefully you can hear that. If not, I'll tell you, then you can listen for it again. What I'm doing is I've created a peak fund where it emphasizes the, the overtones, the, 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 the hearable tone of that snare, and I'm moving it around. I'm moving around kind of in time, but not perfectly in time. And the whole idea there is because this is a loop and very static, our snare drum being often one of the most noticeable things in there, even though everyone's going to focus on the kick drum, but it's the, the counterpoint to the kick drum. Therefore, movement in one place creates the feeling of illusion of movement elsewhere. So our snare drum seems to move around, more like if it were a real-world snare drum. We wouldn't hit it in exactly the same mechanical spot over and over again. We would hit it in different spots. Well, we don't want it to be as obvious as this, because that's just a bit much. Flat, same snare every time. That moves around. We want to subtle that back a little bit. And therefore, we've got nice movement now. The other bit of movement that I've got here is just a level movement. On its own, you don't hear a lot of difference. I've used a less than perfect shape, so I've just dragged it about a little bit so that we've got less than entirely regular movement, even though it is quite regular. The combination of these two Now when we put that reverb back in lot more bite and presence in that kit because it's actually moving around a lot but in ways that people won't pick it still very much sounds like a drum machine but it's a dramatic sounding drum machine a cool sounding drum machine and people would just go oh well you've got you've used some nice analog effects and nice saturation in there there's no saturation in there at all i've just made things move cool so within the mix Kind of flat and a bit pasty. Big and rich and vibrant. The bass. That was actually a preset, I modified it a little bit. And it's exactly the same, I just copied and pasted presets and, and, and modified them, which is not a thing I would really do in the real world. I would make new ones for every time, but the same concept of just having this move. Now, there are two advantages here. One is, obviously, we have got a boost. And that boost is uh, fairly noticeable, and it's in the... Uh, we should have a spectrum. Rather than boosting the fundamental, I'm aiming to pull out the first overtone a little bit, so it makes it seem a lot richer. Cool. That one's not actually doing anything. We didn't need him at all anymore. And because that's moving around, again, is picked up by Hertz Multiplier, which is all about creating lots of movement, which creates lots of phase cancellations and all kinds of cool stuff. In the mix, kind of flat and not very present. And here, how the bass itself, the kick drum, and the bass overall suddenly becomes a lot better. Interesting. Some of that is going to be due to this little fella. You see me do this over and over again.
We're creating movement. We're creating punch. We're actually creating a sense of greater level by moving our volume up and down, which is exactly what I'm doing here, moving our volume up and down, but just in a frequency area in the mids. I'll pop up the picture if I can of the U mix in the middle and ignore the outside. This is based on that premise, U mix the middle. So we're focusing people on the middle, the bit that really counts, and going up and down. And here it's going up and down, and the up and down in level. It's not as even as you think because compressors are actually weighted towards being heavy handed on the high end because those sounds are quieter, they're more delicate, so they, they, they get more hammered, especially seeing they're driven by the heavier, bassier sounds, which actually hammer the high end. So they create this feeling of emphasizing the low end when it comes through, which is part of why compression is so such a cool thing to use when you want to create this feeling of biggerness. Oh. By reducing our overall level, we've created more sense of punch and movement because that whole spectrum is actually moving. The high end is being squished more than the low end. Therefore, there's this constant change of tone. And then our pad. That's not doing anything, so it shouldn't be there. Flat. You can hear a slight phasery sort of thing in here. It's subtle, but that's the EQ doing its job, including making and taking advantage of their phase shifteriness. Now, here's a cool experiment that you can try. I don't have anything that really suits. Uh, actually, I do. Bear with me a second. I'm borrowing one of the kids' piano books. These are quite good because they're shiny. You can probably see a little bit of shiny, shiny on the surface. Grab something like this, magazine, penthouse, whatever. Is it penthouse is still going? Is penthouse still going thing? Whatever. Something with a shiny cover is great. And if it's bigger than your average little reading book, good, but otherwise you can just use a reading book. Something you borrow from the library. I hope you read. It's good for the soul. Have your speakers, obviously over there, and then put it between yourself and the speaker and move it around like this. You will hear a real enhancement, particularly of highs. You'll get this tremendous hyper clarity of certain highs. And as you move it around, you'll be able to hear this sort of swishiness as it changes the balance of the frequencies that you are hearing. That's what I'm doing here. And before you go, but that's not relevant. We don't walk around like doing this to the world. Oddly enough, we do. I'm in a room here. You can see some walls and ceiling. Every time I move my big head and my enormous ears, then I'm changing the relationship, just like doing this with the world around me. Thank you. Uh, the uh, movement that we're doing in here with this string sound is actually a sort of emulation. Not AI stupidity, it's not machine learning, it's just human. We can sort of say, okay, well, where do I want this to move around and draw attention to itself in a good way? We can do it in a bad way, but why would we want to do it in a bad way? We want to do it in a good way for the piece of music. I want this string to seem beautiful in its context. So it goes very flat and rigid. MIDI sound. And you notice that despite the fact that this is a cut, this actually seems to get brighter. It's ever so slightly quieter, but it becomes more... Because we're unmasking some of the high highs by pulling at those little bits in the, in the mid to highs. Therefore, we're unmasking those, making them a little less... Ma what, masked, hidden behind those other more 
dominant frequencies in here because that's quite dominant in strings. So we make it seem brighter and, and more hyper real, but at the same time also move it backwards a little bit. Kind of cool. And that changes how it's influenced by any of the mastering, which is closed here, but we can open it up. There's no secrets there, just a little bit of compression, which is being largely driven by the drums, which means that there is a little bit of pushing down of everything else, which is similar to the ducking or side chain, if you don't know how to speak mixing. Uh, that's just causing everything to move, which again adds this huge amount of vibrance and that all is driven into everything else, which compounds, so layers. So flat, no movement whatsoever. Movement with EQ and that little bit of compression, and then adding in reverb to embiggen everything. Flat. Lively. And it's with very tiny movements, which are a little bit of side to side, in this case to emphasize that snare to make it seem to move around, which makes everything else in the kit relatively different. This move here, which just adds so much more vibrance and pulls the focus into the center, doesn't reduce our bass at all. It actually makes our bass seem better because it becomes more lively. These which are really flat and rigid and sound like they've been pasted on and now are lively and rich. So the point here is that we can make massive gains in our mixing by doing quite small things, but it's not by doing them thoughtlessly or by rote. So if you have been watching this video or turned off this video already going, oh, well, that guy uses Reason and he uses Killer Heart stuff and I don't use Reason because I use a different door, which is inherently way better because I'm me and my favorite musician uses that. This is why you're struggling. Get in there, use whatever tools you've got. The reason I chose Snap Heap to show was in part because they have just released the um, Grain Oscillator which, oh, over here, because I wasn't really intending to show it. So using a grain oscillator, no, that's no, not the one. I need to be over here. Ooh, grain. Easy way to make cool strings sound really, really fast. Uh, so that's what I thought, well, I might as well show lots of their stuff because I think they do a super, super job uh, with, with their product. I could have shown it with Reason stuff, but getting Reason to do more complex things like this is, it's visual in a wonderful way, but it's a very Reason way, whereas this is a little bit more what people are used to in VST-ville, whilst being incredibly visual. So it's nothing to do with the tools, it's all to do with the viewer trying to make things visual. And of course this, which is totally free on the higherhertz.com, website and has its own video, which no doubt I shall endeavor to put up, which shows how we can add a lot of movement using very similar techniques. It's micro, micro movements to be a little bit below conscious notice, but well, well within emotional notice. And that's what all of this is about. Now, if you have any questions about this technique, not about a third party products, please, because that's not for me, uh, then pop them in below. Hopefully after subscribing, please explain the whole story. Just saying, oh, well, my mix sucks or whatever. Okay, hire a mix engineer. I've talked about that in other videos. Uh, if you're wanting to learn, then you need to actually really explain things. One of the best ways to explain is, of course, to actually let us hear things. If you don't want to let us hear things, then, well, you're not ready for the bigs. You're not ready to publish. Enough from me. Get out there, work hard, find what makes you you. And I'm delighted if you do stuff that really is you, not just cloning 
especially not cloning everything I've just done here, please. And come back, show us, link to things that you've done that are really cool like that, because that shows, hey, we're getting places. Have a wonderful day.